Remington is the oldest continuous gun manufacturer in America. Uh, they're the only American manufacturer that makes both uh, firearms and ammunition in America. They sell more sporting rifles and shotguns than any other company in America. They've developed more cartridges than any other American firearms company. They attribute their beginnings in 1816 to a, a lifelet Remington II. The turn of the century, a little before 1800, a lifelet Remington's father moved from Connecticut all the way over here to the wilds, to the frontier, and uh, set up a farm and set up a forge. And most of the forge work his father was doing was repairing agricultural implements and such like that. So a young lifelet Remington II learned the forging process at that time. And we don't know why, but at one point, he decided to forge his own rifle barrel. So a lifelet then forged his own barrel and had no means to make a rifle at the time. Uh, he had no expertise at all as a gunsmith. So he took this raw barrel and brought it to a gunsmith over in Utica, about 12 miles away, to have it finished, reamed and rifled, and made into a flintlock rifle. And that's the beginning of the industry that is now 200 years old. Now, Remington's first guns that we know are definitely Remington's. Uh, they got in on some U.S. military contracts for a Jenks. Uh, then, of course, the U.S. model of 1841 rifle, better known as the Mississippi rifle. And Remington continued to fulfill these military contracts, but also started developing guns of its own. Uh, they partnered with some very key people early on, uh, one of which, of course, was Fordyce Beals. And Beals held some patents on revolvers. Uh, and as early as the 1850s, uh, the Remington Beals revolvers in early form were starting to be offered. Those patents eventually turned into what we call the 1858 Remington or the New Model Army uh, and quite a few variations. And those are percussion cap and ball revolvers. And everyone seems to collect Colts when they don't realize that back then anyway, the Remington revolver was the better mousetrap. First of all, Remington had a top strap, unlike their major competitor, which made the frame stronger, more durable, and in combat, guns tend to be abused, but more so because of Remington's proprietary mechanism for removing the cylinder pin, rolling the cylinder out of the gun, and the fact that virtually all Remington cylinders were interchangeable. So, for example, if you're a cavalryman with another revolver, once it's empty, you have a short-handled club. If you were armed with a Remington revolver, you could bring multiple preloaded spare cylinders with you, and even on horseback during the heat of battle, it was possible to fairly easily swap out an empty cylinder, put a full cylinder in, you're now back in action. You might say that those were the first magazine or multiple shot handguns ever effectively manufactured. And, and because of that, the Remington designs were highly uh, desirable to the soldiers, particularly the cavalrymen during the Civil War. With the Civil War ending in 1865, I said that was the death knell for many, many of the manufacturers in both the North and the South who had been making weaponry for their armies. Remington was one of the very few companies that was able to weather the storm of going from the old percussion era to the metallic cartridge era at a time when the army needed no more weapons. They did it primarily because of Joseph Ryder's design of the rolling block system. The rolling block turned out to be a very efficient military rifle. As a matter of fact, it is the rifle that propped Remington up for the second half of the 20th century. They sold rolling blocks in more than 20 different chamberings to countries all over the world. But the rolling block also became, in the West, a buffalo gun, and in the East, it became a Creedmoor rifle. The rolling block, it's just a dirt simple mechanism. Only two parts on the thing move, the block and the hammer. Want to know what's happening at American Rifleman? Follow us on Twitter and like us on Facebook. We'll be right back.
In addition to firearms made in commercial, large commercial quantities, Remington over the years has also manufactured some guns in small number that are, are different and quite interesting. One example is the Remington cane gun in about 1856. The gun looked like a walking stick cane. It had, came with different heads. Some were plain, some had dog's head or whatnot. Um, they were single shot guns where you would grasp the barrel of the cane and the handle, pull it apart to cock it, push it back, and there was a button which was a trigger. They were initially made in percussion and later in, in rimfire calibers giving the, the casually walking gentleman at least one shot with his cane before it became a club to beat off assassins. Another example of about the same time was the revolving rifle. Remington took their Civil War version of handgun, modified the grip, gave it a longer barrel, longer web under the barrel, put it into a stock to make a revolving rifle. Again, initially in percussion, and later using a conversion cylinder in rimfire. It was an interesting concept to try to use up revolver parts, but realistically, it was never a real popular gun because black powder revolving pistols tend to spit out lead and gases and whatnot from the cylinder, and do you really want that cylinder right here by your eyes? So they were made, they're, they're neat and interesting, but you don't see them very often, and when you do see them, if they're in good condition, their collector's price will reflect their rarity. Derringer was the name of a percussion pistol manufacturer in Philadelphia, Henry Derringer, and he was so well known for his pocket-sized single-shot percussion pistols that his name became synonymous with any small handgun. Among Derringers, the image that comes to everyone's mind when you say Derringer is the Remington Double Derringer. People who don't know anything about guns know the Remington Derringer as the gun that is up the riverboat gambler's sleeve. And it's a little two-shot, 41 rim fire, uh, introduced in the 1860s, produced up through World War II. Copies of it are still being made today incredibly popular and part of a very popular line of uh, uh, Derringer pistols that uh, Remington produced. In the 18, late 1860s, 1870s, and 1880s, Remington actually inviting other designers to come to the company, developed the first effective typewriter business, which still exists today. They designed bridges, they design street cars, they design fire engines, and the list goes on and on and on of the different types of companies. Some say that Remington over-diversified. By the end of the 1880s, Remington had a number of different calamities happen. And in 1886, Remington went into receivership for two years. But Remington emerged from that by being purchased by Marcellus Hartley of Schuyler Hartley and Graham. And that was a new era for Remington. It infused new cash in what they needed and brought the company to new heights. The new company was now called Remington Arms Company. And under the leadership of Marcellus Hartley, who also owned Unimetallic Cartridge Company, these two separate companies continued on, on through until much later when they would be merged together. Remington was also an early adopter of bolt actions. You had the Remington Lee, uh, of course, with its detachable box magazine. You also had the Remington Keen. And while Remington didn't have a lot of luck with its repeating rifles, they eventually had a lot of luck with the repeating shotgun. John Browning had developed in the late 1800s a system of automatic loading of firearms, both shotguns and rifles. And the first company he went to was he wanted to talk to Remington. He brought his design in 1902 to Marcellus Hartley in New York City, 
He had an appointment with him at roughly one o'clock in the afternoon. John Browning, being very punctual, got there early. Within a few minutes, the secretary came out and said, we're sorry, Mr. Browning, but Mr. Hartley cannot join you. He died over lunch. Browning was flabbergasted by this awful news, thinking that Remington, the best gun company of the world at that time, could not take his brand new inventions. S knew that he had no one to speak to of that kind of caliber, decided to wait, went aboard a boat, went over to Fabrique Nationale, and interested them in his auto-loading shotgun, the first effective modern shotgun in the world. Fabrique Nationale loved his design and actually made up both an auto-loading shotgun and an auto-loading rifle. But Browning said that you can, you can manufacture and market these only in Europe, not in the United States. Returning then to America, Browning went back to Remington, now under the control of the grandson of Marcellus Hartley, who realized right away that this was a wonderful design. Hence, what later became called the Model 11 Remington autoloading shotgun, first made in 1904, and the first effective Remington autoloading rifle, the Model 8, two years later in 06.